Previously on the Sly Marathon. Yep, that's what fans were left with in 2010 Sly Collection. Not only was Sly fresh in your mind after reliving all three games, but a teaser hinting at a Sly 4 possibly coming to PS3 was hidden and you would only get it after you beat all three games. This was pretty big as after Honor Among Thieves, Sucker Punch went to make Infamous on PS3. In that time, Sly just kind of vanished from the gaming world, only showing his face in this game that Sony says happened, but it didn't. It's a big conspiracy, and PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, which maybe we'll get to some point down the road. But anyway, this sparked new hope for the Sly fans as Cooper wasn't out for the count yet. Then Sly 4 was officially revealed at Sony's E3 2012 press conference. Of course, fellow Sly fans and myself were getting excited to see the lovable thief back. But there was also a lot to worry about. For one, the game was not being handled by Sucker Punch. In fact, they had very little to no involvement with the project. Instead, it was being handled by Sanzaru Games, who made the Sly Collection, and that's all worth noting. And the other reason? Uncertainty of the quality. See, you know how Nintendo is overly protective with their IPs? Sony might be the exact opposite, well they'll just throw them to whoever they want to without any kind of background check. And many of the great Sony platformers died in the hands of these other companies, with very painful falls on the way down. So safe to say, Sly fans weren't exactly thrilled at the idea of Sly falling victim to this as well. So the pressure was on. What's odd though is that right around release, Sony just stopped marketing it, and I have no idea why. Well, to make the game more enticing, it was $40 at launch, and it gave you cross-play with the PS Vita. Now it's much lower and not hard to find at all. But is it worth getting in the first place? Man, people seem to have a different view about this game left and right all over the internet. So what does Nourish Mo have to say about Sly 4? Let's find out. And yes, I know I'm in the college dorm now. Shut up. Now, Thieves in Time isn't a reboot of any kind. It takes place a few years after Sly 3. So without spoiling too much, the game has disbanded and has all gone their separate ways. Sly is now with Carmelita after he gained amnesia. But surprise, he faked it the entire time. And no, this is not a cop-out, it was shown in Sly 3, FYI. Bentley and Penelope have been off in their lab inventing, and Murray has been both racing and been in demolition derby with the team's van. Everything was going well, until one day the Thievius Raccoonist starts having its pages erased, because someone has been screwing with the past. Bentley goes to reform the gang and make sure the book goes back to the way it was. But they keep the Thievius Raccoonus with Dimitri in the present to make sure it doesn't get stolen while they time travel. Which by the way, have we seriously just forgotten that this guy was a criminal at this point? But for the most part, that's a story. I mean, there is a plot twist that happens near the end of the game that I swear I'm one of the only people that actually liked it. But really, it just plays it very simple. Which might be a disappointment for some fans considering the complex plots of Sly 2 and 3, but I feel this makes it rather easy to go along with and follow. And they even cover their tracks with time travel saying that they need an item from the era that they're going to. And for a time travel story, it doesn't actually make that many plot holes, so I gotta give them a forever for that. And time travel I feel works really well for this situation because 1. Bentley even said that he was building a time machine, and 2. You get to interact with Sly's ancestors, and considering everything you've heard about them in the previous games, that's pretty good fan service overall. Not to mention that the game overall feels very connected between all the chapters like Sly 2. Mainly the end of one chapter will lead right into the next chapter, which you know I'm all for. In fact, you could argue that this is the most continuous story of all the games, as you're never really brought to an episode select screen. You just go right from one chapter into the next, which keeps everything flowing very well. Even with the simple story, there are some great character building moments, especially for Carmelita, finally getting some character development. Seriously, the only thing that changed about her in the first three games is her voice, and that's it. And ultimately, in the hands of a new developer, I think it's a good idea to not go crazy with the plot and play it very natural. 
Now in terms of the presentation, let's just get this straight. These in Time is a beautiful looking game. Not only does each environment look stunning, but they all look incredibly diverse and honestly more alive than the areas in the past. And Sly fans will notice right away how smooth everything looks now, mainly the character animations. In the past, they would always move from one point to another in the animations, and they looked a bit stiff as a result. It wasn't necessarily a problem, it was just how it was. But here, everybody's given full animations and it looks great overall, especially the Binocucom scenes where they benefit a lot from this. The cutscenes are also now full on 2D animations, which is really awesome. And it makes it feel like a Saturday morning cartoon, which is great. In fact, these actually happen more frequently throughout the game this time. They even have James Bond-like effects for when you beat a mission, which is a really nice touch. Now as for the time of day, it's kind of a mixture of night and other times of the day. But I think it works rather well, even for the daytime missions, such as a sunset for the Old West and sunrise for Ancient Arabia. So they add a lot more to the atmosphere. And of course the voice acting is still solid. Everybody comes back to reprise their roles and they're just as great as they were before. Except for Carmelita who, yeah, a new voice, again. Okay, I swear, it's tradition at this point. And what do I think about this one? She's actually really good. She has a very heavy Latina accent, but her acting is great and feels very consistent in quality. If we do keep her as the mainstay voice, I'll be totally fine with that. All of Sly's ancestors also do a great job and really fit their characters well. Well, maybe not Bob, he just kind of mumbles. Wait a second, he has subtitles! Take notes, Guru. And the villains? Possibly the best performances of the whole cast. They really go all out with them and make them full of character, which makes them much more memorable and a lot of fun. Characters do talk a lot more than before. They even talk to themselves during missions. I can see how this be annoying to some people, but to me it just reinforces the Saturday morning cartoon feel even more. And sometimes they do make some good remarks. For such a tough guy, he sure runs away a lot. Not to mention he gives you something to listen to as you're going through the missions, which is nice. And don't worry, they rarely ever repeat lines. Now going around the internet, it seems that many people's biggest problem with the presentation is the new character designs. And I think this picture is to blame for that, which, yeah, this picture looks flat out ugly. But honestly, I actually really like these designs. I mean, I do find myself adjusting to redesigns faster than other people generally, but I think these look very similar to their counterparts and they look very natural for the world that they're in. Though I do have some personal problems with the presentation, one is the color consistency. Here's what I mean. See, in cutscenes, Sly's backpack is red, but in-game it's brown. And Murray is purple in the cutscenes, but he's pink in-game. But then again, Murray was pink in the cutscenes and purple in-game in the original trilogy. I, 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 I don't want to think about it too hard. And the other would be that the sound sometimes desyncs in in-game cutscenes, but it will catch up in the same scene most of the time. Overall, it's not too bad, but it is a little distracting. But easily my favorite part of the presentation, the soundtrack. It's flat out incredible. It blends the themes of the past with music from the different time periods together beautifully. All the songs have strong, recognizable melodies, and they're synced to the cutscenes' actions. Seriously, look up any track from this game and you'll enjoy it. Overall, the game looks and sounds great. It still captures the feel of the past games while adding its own flair and shine being on a more powerful system, and it really makes the game stand out. Now, the gameplay is similar to the past games. Open worlds, mission-based structures, perform a heist, defeat the big bad, and move on. It was great 8 years ago and it's still fantastic now, but there are some big changes from Honor Among Thieves. For one, the only characters that return are Sly, Bentley, Murray, and Carmelita. So I hope you didn't get too attached to the other 4 characters. But for me, the only new character I enjoyed anyway was Carmelita, so I have no problem with this. Sly is pretty much the same as he was before, but his big addition this time is costumes. He'll receive one per chapter and each has their own abilities. He can also use them to get past guards like an honor among these. But this time there's no Simon Says required. For instance, with the samurai armor, the guards in Japan will salute you and let you pass on by, speeding up the pace of the game a lot. Not only that, but they also have secondary abilities as well, such as the armor protecting Sly from fire and being able to shoot fireballs right back. 
There's also the prison outfit that gives him a heavy ball and chain to throw around to move objects and to roll around on the ball to gain some speed. Or the archer outfit that allows Sly to make new rope platforms. The costumes are an awesome addition and I feel some real thought went into making them, but I'll go into more about that later on. Next up is Bentley who feels a lot more smooth and natural compared to how he was in Sly 3, and even comes equipped right off the bat with a hover pack. He also has these robotic hands on his chair that are used for pickpocketing, throwing bombs, and even back massages. He has all of that in his wheelchair, but no cup holders. Bentley, you're missing the essentials, man. He also comes equipped with three different types of hacking minigames, which thanks to this little bug device you can play even if you're not controlling Bentley at the time. The first one is the classic overhead shooter, which is probably the best version of this stage, as you now have three different types of ships to use, adding some good variety. Next up is a side-scrolling shooter stage where you need to collect power-ups to increase your level, and these are probably my favorite. And then there's one where you need to guide an electric ball to the end by using the 6-axis controller. Yeah, the 6-axis! You remember? That thing where you had to tilt the controller all over? Yeah, it was pretty dumb. Luckily, it's not too bad here and they're over really quick. He also has RC vehicles and I have to say, these control MUCH! better than the ones in Slide 3. They're very responsive, incredibly smooth, and they gave me no trouble whatsoever. Next up is Murray, who's probably the least changed out of everyone. Sorry, old chum. And finally, there's Carmelita, who before, you could only play in certain missions. Now you can play as her whenever you would like. And the best change to Carmelita is easily her control. She now has full movement and you only strafe when you hold down the L1 button. This makes her way more fun to play as, and she even gets her own boss fight later in the story. And that's it for the main four, but in each chapter, you get to also play as one of Sly's ancestors. And to be honest, it's not that different from playing Sly, as they're basically a Sly with no extra power-ups and one unique power. But what's cool is that their missions usually are built around their powers and lead to some really cool level design such as Ryorichi Cooper, who is able to warp between spire jump points, and Tennessee Kid Cooper who can shoot targets with his gun, and even enter a slow motion crack shot mode. Or Sir Gallif Cooper who can catapult himself off of hooks. These add some good variety and it's just fun for Sly fans. Now in terms of what you do in the hub worlds, there are three main collectible items to get. First off are the clue bottles. Yes, they're finally back and I'm thrilled as they make you explore the level a lot more, and they're a lot more hidden than they were in the past. Slides past anyway. It's time travel, I gotta make it clear. So good luck finding them. If you get all 30 in a level, you get to open a safe, which in previous games just gave you a new move. But this time, it gives you a passive ability, such as drawing coins near you, taking less damage, or seeing where other clue bottles are, which is a much better incentive to get them all. Next up is the fine art from Slide 2, now known as Treasures. They're all unique this time and each has a time limit to get back to the hideout. You get extra coins by getting them, as well as being able to view them in a gallery. You'll be using your costumes a good amount of the time in order to get them. So for the sake of your sanity, don't try going for all of them on your first run. And lastly, there are Sly Masks hidden throughout the entire game. For every 5 or 10 that you collect, you gain a new cosmetic change, such as changes to your paraglider, a costume for each character, and changes to Sly's cane, which trust me, those cane ones are pretty cool. Even the hideout has gotten a bit of an upgrade. What used to be a place that you just select your character and use ThiefNet, now has a gallery for your treasures and costumes, a warping point to each chapter and mission, and even a little mini game of ping pong that you play for a trophy, and a bonus hacking level when you get all the treasures in a chapter. But other than that, that's pretty much the gameplay for Thieves in Time. Man, that took a lot longer than I thought it would. So what does Thieves in Time do right? Well, let's go from the little things into the big things. First off, navigation is easier than it ever has been before, thanks to a new arrow showing your way to your next job. Even showing the height that you need to go to, and a radar on the left as well. Though you can turn it off if you want to. But you're gonna want to use it as these are easily the largest hub worlds that the series has seen yet. But unlike Sly 3, I think these hub worlds are really where the game shines, and there's a lot to do in them. They feel a lot more real and alive than they have been in the previous games. And what I mean by alive is that even though they don't have anyone besides guards in them, 
Their overall designs just make them feel a lot more natural, yet still have an incredible jungle gym-like aspect to them, which makes them a blast to go through. Not to mention that there are several ways to get around the hub world, which make them a lot more fun to go through, such as this rail you can ride in the west, and these catapults in England that can make getting around very fun and fast. You also have a ton to do in these hub worlds, such as the returning clue bottles, which are still a ton of fun to get, and reward you a lot more for going out of your way. But my favorite collectible is easily the different treasures you get. Not only do you get to keep them this time, not to mention some of them can be pretty amusing, the fact that each of them is timed is a really cool idea. It makes you learn the map even more and try and find the fastest route back to the hideout, which can be both fun and exhilarating. Even getting to them is a lot of fun, as the majority of them you get to by using the different costumes and their powers. You even combine the outfits at certain points, making for fun little mini challenges that can often lead to little extra areas on the map. Adding a bit of a Metroidvania element to Sly, which I think works really well with the series. You also do get money for this just like the treasures before, and you're gonna want that money as many of the upgrades this time are fantastic. In the other games, they've been really hit or miss, but I'd say this time there's a good 80% of these power-ups that are truly amazing and are very useful. Not only do you get the really good power-ups from the past such as the paraglider, silent obliteration, and adrenaline burst really early on, but you get even more great powers as well, such as being able to run on tight ropes or run without making a sound, being able to move while pickpocketing, having a longer duration for the adrenaline burst, a shield for when you're throwing bombs, more coins when you shake enemies, rapid fire and charge shots for Carmelia. these powers are simply awesome and are well worth the time and money for getting them. Now while the story might not be as crazy or in depth as the other games, I still had a lot of fun with it, and the time travel aspect I feel is one of the better implementations of it that I've seen in a platformer, mainly because of the different interactions with the people that are in that time period, and the clashes that they have with the Cooper gang and villains. Like how Sir Gallif is such a headstrong, ask questions later kind of person. Or Salim Al Kupar, who you meet around the time of his retirement, and honestly, he doesn't want anything to do with the jobs that the gang has for him. And the villains, even better interactions as they're so colorful and really stand out. In fact, this might be my favorite villain lineup of the whole series because of how much fun it is to mess with their plans. And to add to this, their boss battles are truly awesome, and again, I think they're the best set of bosses in the series. I didn't really enjoy them my first time playing around, but replaying the series and seeing how most of the Sly bosses are just hit the guy until they die? These feel much more unique and a lot more fun. They're really cinematic, but they also require you to learn patterns a lot more, and even have puzzle elements to them, and Sly's fights also have some really good usage of the costumes. I was skeptical before the game came out that with it being in the hands of another developer, that the game wouldn't really feel like the other Sly games. Don't worry, this really feels like a Sly Cooper experience. You feel like a thief once again and stealing even more than before, and keeping a low ground on your enemies this time before the big heist. In fact, you trail enemies even more now, which makes you feel a lot more sneaky than before. This game also has a lot more platforming than the other games, and it works really well. It's really fun to go through these sections, and it's some of the best 3D platforming I've done in years. Plus, Sansaru Games were huge fans of the original series, and made sure to take extra care with the good old Cooper. The game really does feel like the others, and I can say this for sure as I went from the first three games right into this, and the change was very natural and not hard for me at all. There's also a lot of fan service for Psy fans all over, such as Lucky Charms from the first game hanging over houses in England, old enemies being parts of treasures that you get, and even Psy having his Italian accent return from Psy 3, which cracked me up. And probably the most famous one, Clockwork appearing in every level of the game if you look for him. These are all great, but they're never rammed into your face, and for me, that's how Easter eggs and callbacks should work. Trust me guys, this really is Sly Cooper, in one round, smooth, and well-crafted game. In fact, I think that's the best word to describe Beezing Time. Smooth. Everything just feels so free-flowing and natural, from the animations, to how the plot progresses, to the missions and the minigames throughout, even to things like Sly being a bit more lengthy with the range of his fire points and such. 
you really feel like you're in control of Sly and it feels incredibly rewarding and fun to play through. But don't get me wrong, we have some problems here. Now while I do love going for the clue balls and treasures on these maps, I really don't like how the masks were handled, and honestly it felt like a complete chore to collect them. For one, I didn't really find many of the rewards to be that great, with the exceptions of the last few, but considering the amount of work you have to put in to get those, really make the rewards not worth it in my eyes. Mainly because there are no hints to where these are. Now while this is also true for the treasures, you find most of those by using your powers in exploring, so I'm okay with that. But with the masks, they can be hidden in missions and they don't give you any idea which missions they're in. The only thing you have is the chapter select screen saying that there's more in that level. Trust me, use an online guide for these, there's no shame in it whatsoever. Now I have seen people complain about the motion controls in some of the minigames, but honestly, you don't use them that much. The parts of the games that have them happen very fast and personally I never had an issue controlling them. It's not a problem for me, but it might be for you. Another common complaint that I've seen is that the other gang members are rarely used, and that you only really get to play as Sly and his ancestors. I'm kinda 50-50 on this. See, you do get to play as them in a lot of the other missions, except for Carmelita, who seriously you only play like 5 times. I think the problem is that you rarely ever get to play as them in the overworld. I mean, Sly has always been the most fun to play as, don't get me wrong, but it was still fun to play as the others, but you rarely ever get to do that. For instance, here's how far I have to travel for a Bentley mission in Chapter 5. Really? Now granted, this is probably the worst case scenario of this, but that's what it feels like most of the time. My next complaint is on the final boss. Now I'm not gonna show it, but it's really disappointing. Now granted, side final bosses have never really been that great besides clockwork, but this one just leaves a bad taste in your mouth. I mean, ironically, it's the shortest boss in the game, but it's still not that great. A minor gripe, but I wasn't a fan of many of the trophies in this game. I mean, some are fine, but please, make sure you know the trophies before starting a playthrough for them. Mainly the map trophy. If you didn't get that one on your first try, oh man, you have just caused a big headache for yourself. And my final issue with the game are the load times. These really can be long. I mean, if you're just exploring the hub world, you only need to load it one time, but if you complete a mission or go into a new area, get ready for a load time 10 to 14 seconds long. I mean, it's not a game-breaking deal or anything, but considering how fast-paced this game is, it makes these feel even longer. When you can look at all your social media pages and the level still hasn't loaded yet, that's a problem. You know, it's very weird. A lot of people will say Sly 3 is the best game in the series, and Sly 4 is just inferior. Well, to me, y'all already know how I feel about Sly 3, and honestly, Sly 4 I think is easily one of the best. I absolutely loved playing through these in time. In fact, I think I enjoyed it even more the second time around. Working on the collection really gave Sansaru Games the opportunity to see what worked and what didn't in the past three games to bring the best elements together for Sly's comeback. A fun platformer that has a lot of variety and fun gameplay mechanics, the level design is easily some of the best in the whole series, add in some wonderful presentation and you have a platformer that people shouldn't miss out on. Even though you can play this just fine without playing the other games, I do recommend you play the rest of the series first. Now as far as ranking it to the other three games, I think it easily beats out Sly 3 and also beats out Sly 1 but I think I just put it right under Band of Thieves. Kind of. Hear me out for a second. I think overall Psy 2 is a better game for being the full package with the story, script, gameplay, and theming. I'm not saying that Psy 4's story or writing is bad, it's just not to the level that it was in Psy 2. But Psy 4 was easily the most fun game to play throughout the entire marathon. And even after finishing the game, I went back and continued to look for all the extras in each level. Not for the review, but just for fun. When I want to keep playing right after I beat the game, that's a sign you've done something right. Sure, the game doesn't do a whole lot to stand out from other games or other platformers in general, but not every platformer has to be the next Mario 64 and reinvent the wheel. Sly 4 was just way too much fun to put down for me, 
and easily shows that the raccoon, even after 8 years, still isn't out yet. And that's pretty much it for these in time. Again, I think it's worth it and I think you should definitely check it out. Oh yeah, there is that. Let's go over that for a second. So this is Bentley's Hack Pack, a $3 download game for the PSN that is kind of like a DLC for Thieves in Time, but it's its own separate game. This is pretty much just a challenge mode for the three different types of hacking minigames in the main game. But they do come with extra objectives for you to beat, and that's pretty much it. It's $3 on there, so if you want to check it out, go on ahead. I downloaded it for this review and I personally got a lot of fun out of it. There is a demo of the game and you'll get about 11 levels in there. If you want to get the rest, you know what to do. So, have at it. And that's pretty much it for the Sly Marathon. I hopefully got you to try out all four of these games because it's really a fun series overall. Sly 1 is an awesome retro style platformer that I can recommend to almost anyone. Sly 2 I think is the true Sly experience and it gets my highest recommendation. Sly 3, despite all my problems with it, is still a fun platformer that I think the fans of the first two games should give a shot. And Sly 4 I think is a great return to form and the perfect way to finish your time with the series. Now in terms of where the series will go from here, that's kind of up in the air at this point. Without giving too much away, the ending of Sly 4 heavily hints at a fifth game. But Santoru Games has stated that they aren't working on Sly anymore and have decided to work with Sega on the Sonic Boom games. And man, they walked into the worst PR nightmare imaginable. So with Sucker Punch and Santoru Games not working on the series anymore, it does leave some uncertainty for the Sly fans. But with Thieves in Time being fairly recent and his CGI movie, there's still hope that Sly can make his way onto PS4 very soon. And if a Sly 5 happens, you know I'll be there for it. But to be fair, I think it's time we get to some other games, so look forward to this Halloween. Anyway, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching everybody, man. It's been a long time trying to get this episode ready, but I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give me a like and comment because that helps me out a lot. Also subscribe for more videos down the line. If you're new to the marathon, you can check out the whole marathon in that playlist on the left. Also, thanks to Fawful's Minion for all his tech work that he did for this episode. Without him, you wouldn't be seeing this review. So if you want to check out his news countdown, click the video on the right. If you want to follow me, you can check me out on Facebook and Twitter. And if you want to support me, go to my Patreon. All the money there goes right back into production. And you also get looks at all the behind the scenes stuff that goes into my videos. Which, by the way, thank you Soul Ninja Star for being my top patron. Thank you, dude. You're awesome. Anyway, I'll see you on Halloween. Take care.